Hello, everyone. My name is Hill Wayne. I'm really excited to be presenting this talk, Tackling Concurrency Bugs with TLA+. You might notice that the name is a little bit different from the guide. That's because I think guidebook and the website crash when you use an actual plus. That's why we had to spell it out. <laughs> we'll be talking about concurrency, why a lot of our tools do not work to address it, and how we can use tools from formal specification to address these problems. Before I begin, though, I have a couple of housekeeping notes. First, I created a Slack channel, TLA+, for anybody who wants to ask questions or follow up afterwards. You might notice that Slack also has problems with the plus symbol. <laughs> Second housekeeping note. Some of you might have noticed this on my profile. On a show of hands, how many of you thought that was a bluff? Well, I brought seven pounds of sesame brittle that I made, so I do not, yeah. I made this, I do not make bluffs, and come see me afterwards. Okay, with that out of the way, let's actually begin. So, a little bit of background on me. I work for a company called eSpark Learning, and the product I work on is also called eSpark. What we do is, at a very, very narrow level, students have iPads, we have diagnoses on how good these students are at various things, and we give them lessons and third-party apps to help them learn those topics. It's a pretty simple system and nothing ever goes wrong with it. Just kidding. This is actually an oversimplification of what this is, and my job in the company is to make sure that this does not fall apart. If there's a bug, it could be anything from an issue with our systems, a bug in our stuff, a bug in some third party, or it could be the school's Wi-Fi is down, or it could be, and this did happen once, unfortunately, Everything is fine except little Timmy and his friends played throw your iPad to heaven and the teacher hasn't noticed that the iPod is now just a bunch of duct tape. But naturally if you try to sort of look at all those issues and fix them one by one, you're going to go insane. So it's more important to look at the broad scopes of problems and figure out how to address them in abstract. So with that in mind, let's talk about concurrency. What exactly do we mean by concurrency? This is strange loop and not grad school, so I'm going to give a very rough definition here. Concurrency is when you have multiple systems that are running independently and they have some sort of shared or global state. Additionally, the systems we're interested in are also non-deterministic, by which we mean that if A happens, then B happens, that may have a different result than B happening and then A happening. One example of this is writers and readers from a queue. Depending on the orders the writers write and depending on how long the readers read from and depending on how long it takes to process the messages, you could get different results just based on the time spans alone. And this is actually a big problem for us as cloud architects because even in the simplest monolith, you have a front end, a back end, and a database, two points of concurrency. And you make it vastly, vastly worse if you have a microservice architecture. If that's happening, then you not only have to deal with all of the services talking to each other independently, but you also have to deal with the fact that the ways they communicate as concurrency too. Is it synchronous, asynchronous, are using queues, publish sub, exactly once, only once, at most once? All sorts of different problems arise. And when you have concurrency, everything falls apart. Let's give an example of what I mean. Imagine we have a banking system. We have Alice and Bob as account holders in this banking system. Alice wants to wire money to Bob. That's gonna happen a lot, just letting you know. The bank also gives us overdraft protection. And what that means is that Alice cannot wire more money than she has in her account. What would this algorithm look like in the abstract? Here's one way we could do it. Step one, check if she has enough money and if not, raise. Step two, add to his account. Step three, subtract from her account. Let's model, model it this way. This is the diagram we'll be using. One check, one plus, one minus. Fortunately, PowerPoint can handle the plus symbol. Now, what happens if this isn't atomic? For example, what happens if, based on your architecture, if you have two wires happening at the same time, one may not finish before the other one starts? That is a possibility. This leads to a thing we informally call this. <laughs> Let's give examples of what we mean by the carnival of horrors. Step one, race conditions. Multiple systems ordering causing problems. Example here, 
you do both checks before any subtractions, and now you've overdrafted. Other things, crashes or partial failure states. This is where you can't guarantee that everything always runs. In this case, imagine if after you've done the addition, but before you've subtracted from Alice's account, you hit the server with a baseball bat. Now the transaction stops, but now Alice and Bob both have money. We've duplicated money. This is a problem. Or a third thing, deadlocks. When every system is waiting for every other system to finish before anything happens. This actually isn't really relevant to our specific example, but I mentioned it for completeness sake. So instead, here's a drawing of Catch-22. <laughs> so hopefully you can see that we have problems and we need to fix these problems. Now, as software developers, we have a lot of tools to fix problems and find problems. Most of them actually do not apply here as much as they wish they would. So with that in mind, I'd like to talk about some of the tools we do have and why they fail. Step one, unit tests. Not knocking unit tests, unit tests are fantastic, I love them, I think we should all be using them. If you're not using them, probably more useful than this talk, let's be honest. They also just do not work on dealing with concurrency problems. Here's an example, we have this as a very simple test. When I receive the message, it sends an alert. Great, you can unit test that, right? How about this? This is now we're adding a lot of different systems here, as well as third party systems and timing issues. That's gonna be really hard to set up. And you could maybe get through it with, by you just mocking everything out, but let's be honest, if you're mocking everything out, you're not actually testing anything. And even if you can set up this entire system, note how we now have three conditions we've added on. Given that any combination of those three conditions could cause a problem, we now have actually eight tests we have to write. In our wire example, we'd have to write this many, given this many um, wires going on simultaneously. You hit combinational, combinatorial explosion very, very quickly, when dealing with multiple systems. And are you really gonna write 18,000 tests? Thought not. So tests don't quite work here as much as we'd want them to. Okay, thing two, static typing. Now, I was given some very important advice before starting this talk, which is, in Strange Loop, if you say anything bad about static typing, your talk's now about static typing. <laughs> so with that in mind, static typing is absolutely perfect. There's nothing wrong with it. You can use type. <laughs> You can use magic, you can use type systems to magically remove every concurrency bug from your problem. You will never have any concurrency bugs ever in any of your programs. But again, we're cloud engineers. We're talking to other people's programs too. And they're not as enlightened as we are. They're gonna have bugs because they're not using magic type systems. So, and when their stuff breaks, it's gonna cause your stuff to break. And can you really go to the customer when they complain, hey, everything's broken, and you tell them, well, MongoDB is known to just randomly drop data and that's why your cat exploded. It's their fault. They're not gonna accept that, are they? And finally, purity, we don't get purity. We're, we're, we're cloud engineers, we're trying, to, we're trying to cause side effects, we're trying to mutate the world. Like, we just do not get the ability to say that we're using only pure functions. So, there's of course other things too, I'd be happy to afterwards talk about why they all fail too. But generally, most of the techniques we have to verify code is correct just don't apply here. And that's because we've actually been looking at this wrong the whole time, at least in this talk. See, all those things we talk about were ways of verifying code works. But there wasn't anything wrong with our code. There was a problem with our system. The code was fine. It's just that we allowed crashes to happen outside of the code. If servers could not crash, we, couldn't we would not be able to duplicate money. Of course, asking that servers don't crash is absolutely insane. We live in the real world, servers crash all the time. But it does mean that we can make possible changes to our system to prevent these problems from happening. One example, see how we had three steps? What if there was only two? What if the addition and the subtraction of the wire happened at the exact same time? We can notify it like this. Maybe that would fix our bug. Maybe that would make it impossible to duplicate money by crashing things. Now, how do we know this? We can start by informally verifying it with pencil and paper, and that's gonna require a lot of manual labor, so it's time to roll up our sleeves, grab some coffee, and ask the intern to do it. Let's go through all the possibilities, or at least let's make the intern go through all the possibilities. No crash at all, no problem. Crashes immediately. Not great, but no duplication of money, right? Crashes right after the check, same thing. Crashes after this transfer, but before you've done any cleanup. Also not great, but the transfer is done. You've not duplicated money. 
there's no way for the crash to happen in between the addition and subtraction under the system. So we can be confident that if we implement this correctly, and we'd have to make sure our code matched this idea, that we wouldn't have the bug. Now, we could also apply this to our other problem, say the race condition where we overdrafted, but that has a lot more cases we have to look at. And because of that, we have to step back a bit. We, as engineers, have always realized one thing, which is that a lot of things are boring and we don't like boring things. When, whenever we can, we use computers to do the boring stuff for us. Not only because they are willing to do it, they can't say no, but also because they're less likely to make mistakes. I knew that if I was trying to verify 24 different possible behaviors, I would make at least one mistake there. So what we want is a way to take this idea of looking at a system, looking at how we've written the system, and going through pencil and paper and writing down every possible scenario and see if they all match. What we do with the computer is something called formal specification. Specification because it accurately describes our system so well that a machine can understand it, and formal because it is so precise that we can objectively, unambiguously say whether or not any conditions are broken. Now, one thing I have to make clear that I find that a lot of people find confusing. This is not our code. We, when we write the specification, we're validating our blueprints, we're validating our design in our heads, our architecture. We still have to make sure that we've implemented the specification correctly in code. That is one of the limitations it's the price you have to pay for flexibility and power. Of course, I'm now just talking all abstract. Let's actually go into details of a specification system. The one I prefer and the focus of this talk is TLA+. TLA+, was invented by Leslie Lamport in 1994. Otherwise, Lamport is known for the Paxos algorithm, most of his works on distributed systems, and inventing LaTeX. He had the idea that with the power of mathematics, it may be possible to create specifications that would be very difficult or impossible to do in programming languages. What that means, um, again, theory, lots of theory, going to skip that. Instead, it'll be a lot easier to show you an example of what I mean. So what we're going to do is we're going to use TLA plus to specify first our simple transaction transfer and show that that works without any changes to the structure and then we're going to add the additional possible wires happening simultaneously and show that it can find that bug. A couple of housekeeping notes again. First of all, because this uses a lot of LaTeX notation, I'm going to be walking through some of the, um, what are they called, operators, et cetera. They're not normal programming operators. I will be calling them out. And the second is that while TLA plus is what drives this, what I write in and what a lot of people actually write in is a language called PlusCal which Lamport invented about 15 years later. It's more programming-like, and it compiles down to TLA+. Kind of like how C compiles to assembly. Now, let's go through our example. First of all, we have, first of all, we have Alice and Bob, they both have accounts. We will say that they each have $10. We're going to have an algorithm, and then we're going to have to say what properties of our system we want. Here's one way we can say what we want. This is called an invariant. It is something that must be true at every step of our system. No overdrafts is defined as, the double equals is defined as, Alice has zero or more dollars, and Bob has zero or more dollars. This is normal set notation. You can actually write the Unicode too. I prefer not to. And when we write our algorithm, we can check this no overdrafts. Except that this right now doesn't scale. It doesn't accurately represent our transfer system, because what if we add, say, Carrie or Dave? We'd have to update our overdrafts um, invariant. So what we'll do instead is start leveraging what we mean by math is more expressive than programs. Step one, we're going to change our setup a bit. Instead of having two distinct variables for each account, we have a set of people and a function from people to the number 10. And that means that for every person in the set of people, a count of that people is 10. Note that TLA plus functions are not the same as programming functions. TLA plus functions are mathematical functions. They map a domain of inputs to a range of outputs. In other words, they are just like PHP's arrays. 
PHP is cutting edge mathematics, fun fact. And with this in mind, we can now write our invariant like this. For all p in the set of, p, in the set of people, the account of p is going to be at least zero. And now note that when we write it this way, even if we say add 100 people to the set of people, the account will still have all of them equal 10, and the overdrafts um, invariant will still be correct and represent our system. With that in mind, let's now actually write our algorithm. First of all, we have a process. That is the part of the code that actually runs and does stuff. We have the variables of the process, how much we want to transfer, $1 from whom to whom, and then we actually have the code. If they have enough money, then you add to their account and subtract from your account. This is pretty standard stuff, with the only thing that might be unusual are these. These are called labels. They represent atomic units of time. What that means is that everything inside the label runs instantly, and then the TLA plus can say some other process is allowed to interrupt. We will see, once we specify multiple transfers, what this actually looks like. With that in mind, though, we now have enough to actually test this system. First, we have to use the IDE. The IDE is called TLA plus toolbox and combines all the tools we use for this. We use that first to compile this into TLA plus. This is what the spec looks like in TLA plus. Hopefully, you can see why I prefer plus count now. Then we have to specify our model. The model shows all the runtime aspects. For us, the only thing we really care, pardon? Um, bigger fonts? Um, unfortunately, not right now, but that is the point, yeah, that's the um, point that I want people to focus on, which is that the invariant, we say that, we specify that the invariant is going to be no overdrafts, and we set that as the thing we're actually going to check. My apologies for the small fonts. I could actually, let me see if I can actually, um, yeah. yeah. And that's why I prefer PowerPoint to Google Slides. I'm, I'm, I'm honest, it's just been a lot nicer to like work in. So then we have our no overdrafts that we're specifying. And with that in mind, we can actually now check our model. The tool we use is called TLC. TLC is an exhaustive brute forcer. It looks at all possible paths through our specification and through that, sees if any of them have any bugs. Actually, here's a fun little exercise. Can anybody guess what TLC stands for? Anyone? Well, turns out nobody knows. <laughs> I'm serious about this. I read all the papers on TLC and TLA+, none of them mention what it expands to. I've read all of the books on it, nobody mentions it. I asked in the news group, and nobody can remember. <laughs> I think it stands for Temporal Logic Checker, but for all I know, it's the Lifetime Channel. <laughs> okay, even so, it's still a fantastic piece of machinery. So let's actually now run our model. I will do this to run it. Hopefully that works. No, that's not working. But, but I am finding that it's kind of hard to do this demo. Oop, there we go. And this is what it looks like when it runs. So you can see there have been no bugs, and our spec is perfect. <laughs> Now that we've done that, let's now break it. Let's add the multiple possible simultaneous wires. To do that, we have to make two changes. First of all, you see how we set that amount is going to be equal to one, right over there? I don't like that. Let's now say that the amount is gonna be some integer in the set of numbers from one to 10. And now instead of having one possible starting state, we now have 10. TLC will have to check all 10 initial states and make sure none of them break our invariant. Change two. You see how the transfer, we say that transfer is just going to be one? Don't like that either. Let's now say it's in the set of two elements, blue and green. There's now a blue transfer and a green transfer. These may run one after another, they may run sequentially, but however they can organize through the labels, TLA plus will have to check every possible ordering. Additionally, while they have a global state they share, each defines its local variables, so each one can choose a different amount. Instead of having one state 10 states we have to check now, we now have 100 initial states. And beyond that, we now have multiple behaviors for each possible starting state. If the blue transfer, if the blue check runs first, we can have the blue addition happen after, or we can have the green check. We can do this all the way through and end up with 24 possible behaviors. 
that times 100 initial states involves 2,400 total behaviors we need to check to make sure that none of them have any mistakes. So let's do that. Let's check all 2,400. And found an error. I'm gonna be honest, I wanted to do a sad trombone, but it was harder to bring in a trombone than a kazoo, so. <laughs> so what happens is that TLC was able to look at all of our states and find one that violated our invariant. It also provided an error trace to show the setup and the res resolution that led to this problem happening. I'm going to walk you through it. Step one, we have the setup. Thing of note is that we have this as our initial setup. The thing to note here is that the amount is that the blue transfer is going to transfer $1, the green transfer will be transferring $10. Then we have our first steps. The main thing is, is that the blue check and addition run but the subtraction has not run. Alice is $10, Bob has 11. But because we haven't subtracted money yet, now the green check can happen. And the green check can pass the check because she still has $10. But then the blue subtraction happens. She only has nine now. But the green check has already happened. It's capable of going through and doing its subtraction too. Alice now has negative $1. And we have violated the overdrafts invariant. We can now make a change to our system and see if that works. One change we can make is that we could say that everything happens in the same database transaction. Then we can run this to see if this works. Spoiler, it does. Alternatively, maybe we can't say that. Maybe we're using a bad database, but we could find some other way, maybe using a caching layer. If so, we could try that, make those changes, and see if that works. Of course, we'd still have to implement this in the code, and we'd have to make sure we are writing the code correctly. But even so, what we've done here is found and fixed a bug without having even started to write code. We're finding bugs and fixing them in the system itself. That's pretty cool. But let's, oh, no, I'm still going. But let's be honest. Who cares? By which I mean, I'm sure everybody here has seen demoitis, which is where something looks really cool in a presentation just like this one, and then is utterly useless in practice. I have a lot of those. I will talk afterwards about them. I have made many mistakes learning things. But, so what I wanna do here is show that this is actually not just possible, but practical. And to do so, I wanna list a three different use cases we found at our work where this has actually solved real problems for us. These are gonna be broad overviews because I really do not wanna to have to walk you through all of our business logic, but hopefully it'll give you enough of an insight to see why I find this so interesting. First case was a Greenfield project, the App Syncer. This is actually our first use of TLA Plus in practice. What we had was we had to talk to a third party API to install applications on devices. But in order to sort of make this performant, we had to do this in a synchronous worker. Additionally, due to some serious bugs in their system, we could not send as many commands as we wanted. We had to minimize the number of commands we could send them. And finally, we found out that they had this one more requirement. If we tried to install an app that was already installed, we would cause a memory leak. Turns out their entire system wasn't idempotent. So we had a spike that we did that we thought fixed these issues. But before continuing, we decided that we should probably model this out in TLA+. This is what this particular invariant looked like in TLA+. For all D in the set of devices, the install count is either zero or one. It cannot be, we can't install it more than one time. We cannot remove it more than one time. We thought we had a pretty good system built, but it found a bug in it. This bug was a fairly gnarly one involving two different workers doing different things, but overlapping in the time range they really shouldn't have, but could it would have led to breaking our contract, it would have led to us doing non-idempotent installs, which would have been very bad. It would have also been the kind of bug that would have taken us a week to find in production. But when we found it with this, it was only five minutes to change our overall architecture to make sure this never happened. When we did implement it, we never saw that bug ever occur. And that was what really sold us on the idea that this could actually be practical. Case two, documentation. We had the system running for a while, a way of doing zero downtime deployments. What we mean is a way of 
updating the servers in our load balancer such that our app is always available, but a client cannot see the same app, cannot see the same code in different versions. They cannot see flickering code. We had already got this working, but we did, we did as an exercise, we specified this in TLA plus. This is what the invariant looked like. There exists a server in the load balancer such that it is not updating and it matches every other server's version. This one did not find any bugs because again, battle-tested system, but what it did provide us was a very, very compact documentation of the overall design. And what happened was another team is now implementing a zero downtime deployment in our other project. And we were able to give them our specification as a broad architecture of how our algorithm works. It was a way of transferring knowledge. And the third case, our most recent, is in the redacted system. It's not actually redacted, that's just the name I gave it. Never let me name things. <laughs> and this is where we can talk about, in an existing system, finding bugs when we try to change it. I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but we have multiple sources sending messages to a large pool of messages. And we have multiple workers reading off these messages and doing long running processes based on them. We had, a few, we had the system already partially working and we had some invariants that satisfied. And then our project manager was like, hey, we have a new requirement. When a worker processes from a source, it isn't allowed to switch to a different source of messages until it's finished all of the messages that are existing in the pool of the existing source. That might be a little bit ambiguous or a little bit awkward to say. This is what it ended up looking like as an invariant, four lines. For every worker in the set, if it is on a source and there's still remaining messages, it's not allowed to change to a different source. And of course it found a pretty narrowly architecture bug that we hadn't implemented yet. Again, not gonna go into the details. And we had again a very simple fix. But remember how I said that we already had some invariants that it satisfied? Turns out that every fix we could find broke a different invariant. And in fact, not only did it break a different invariant, it broke that invariant in a way that required 17 steps to reproduce the error. We were unable to find a simple way of reproducing this that didn't require an insane amount of complication. And all the change, simple changes we thought that would be easy intuitive changes to make retroactively broke the old invariants. This was showing us that we did not understand our system well enough to do both invariants at once. Eventually we came back to the project manager and were like, okay, we figured it out. Either we relax the old invariants, we relax the new invariant, or you give us two months to completely redesign everything. We relax the old invariants. <laughs> so not only did being able to model us give us a deep understanding of what we need to change, it saved us a lot of work. That was pretty cool. So hopefully this should be enough to sort of show you that this is at least worth exploring, that this is an interesting idea, and that Leslie Lamport for inventing this is this terrifying, scary man. So with this last section, I would like to talk about where to get started. The first resource is mine. This is something I wrote called learntla.com. And what it is, is it is a beginner level introduction to using TLA plus and specifying. It assumes no initial knowledge and all of the exercises and examples are designed to be practical use cases. For example, when talking about the currency, the example I use is not going over a rate limiter. At the same time, it only covers the 30% of the simplest part of TLA plus. Still enough to do some really great stuff, but not exactly at an advanced level. That's intentional and a limitation. More advanced than that is the canonical and only book on TLA+, Specifying Systems by Leslie Lamport. He's working on a sequel called The Hyperbook, but that's still in progress, so I'm a little bit reluctant to fully recommend it. It is the canonical text and covers almost the entire range of TLA+, including the theory, most of the, remain, most of the library packages. It does not use Pluscal. Lamport invented it about five years after he wrote this book, and it's at an intermediate level. And then the final resource, if you're interested in the abstract theory, is TLA plus in theory and practice. Ron Presler is actually the person who got me interested in this in the first place. And he's written a deep dive into the temporal logic that underpins TLA plus. It's not focused on the actual use of it in day-to-day -day life, but it's a good thing to read if you're interested in sort of how this works from the bottom up. And with that, thank you so much for coming. I'm Hillel Wayne. Find me after if you have any questions or you just want some food. <laughs>